Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Record Player. My guest today uh, on TRP is multi-platinum selling and Grammy winning artist who is the, the leader of one of the most iconic and loved hip hop groups of all time, Arrested Development. Uh, they have a brand new song out called Vibe uh, and a new album coming. I am joined by Speech today on The Record Player. How are you, my friend? I'm doing great. I'm doing really good. Uh, only thing I'll say is the record is actually available, but on Bandcamp. Are you familiar with Bandcamp? No, well, well, we are, but it's not quite as, as huge here as it is uh, as it is other places. Okay. Yeah, so Bandcamp, we, we, we decided to release the record for our biggest fans, like our most dedicated fans, uh, a little early than when we released it on all the streaming services. So it's on Bandcamp right now, which is, the album's called For the F in Love. Awesome. Well, I'll be getting Bandcamp because the only thing I've got is Apple, because, you know. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. But I'm on it. Uh, the first time I heard the new track, though, the, the one song that I have heard off it, uh, Vibe, the first time I heard that was when I actually saw the video for the first time. Oh, wow. And that nice. Looked, that looked like a whole lot of fun to shoot. <laughs> it was. It was a lot of fun, man. We, you know, I do, uh, I do have an affinity for the South and also for rural South. So horses, pigs, you know, goats, <laughs> chickens. And so we shot the video at my... Um, my cousin's farm and it's a ball we had a great time yeah uh, it certainly looked like it uh driving around i hope you didn't hurt anybody on that tractor but uh. <laughs> I, I i think i ran over a few people but it's you know they'll they'll live <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell me a little bit about that song specifically uh you got to yeah. work with daddy kane i don't know if you'd ever worked with big daddy in the past but uh tell me a bit about that song yeah i worked with big daddy kane on concerts so me, him, and Karis One did shows together in DC, a few other locations. And that was like probably 20 years ago, 15 years ago. So when I called him to get on this new album, he was um, he was excited to do it, but it took him a long time to respond. So I wasn't sure if he was gonna do it or not. And he responded about a month later after I reached out to him. And, and I was very grateful because, you know, he's a extremely talented and respected lyricist and he's, high up on my book. And so I also felt like, um, you know, Big Daddy Kane on that particular music for Vibe just really would be perfect. He's a smooth operator. This music is smooth. And I thought it would be a good marriage. And it was, I mean, it's like such a perfect marriage between him, of course, Arrested Development, Configa on the track, Tasha LeRae and Cleveland P. Jones. It's just great, great marriage. It is. It's a, and it's a fantastic song. Um, Thank you. Yeah, an awful lot's happened in the world since in the last two years uh, since uh, Don't Fight Your Demons in 2020. Um, the, we can always count on you to be socially conscious in your lyrics and, and, and all that, but you've, you had some unprecedented stuff to draw from in the last couple of years writing this record. Yeah, that's true. Um, what, is, is the record, I mean, how much on the pandemic and on, on, on that have you, have you touched down on this? You know, there's one song in particular that talks about the pandemic directly. Well, two songs that talk about it directly. One is called um, Where the Lions Roam, or it's called Where Lions Roam. And then the other is called Swing em. Now, Swing em is just a posse track. And I'm just talking about how I'm feeling good, despite the fact we're not making any money from touring. Because of the pandemic, you can't go out and tour nearly as much as we used to. For most artists, touring is the way you're going to make most of your money right now, because streaming you know, sort of took away the ability to make any money from your records and people don't buy records as much. So um, I talk about that on Swing em, but on Where Lions Roam, I really just talk about the whole, you know, there's anti-maskers, anti-vaccination people, pro-mask, pro-vaccination people. And there's this whole, you know, sort of culture war going on. So I talk about that on that song. So, but to me, the whole album, and Don't Fight Your Demons album, which both came within the pandemic, is really because of the pandemic. I mean, I don't even know if either of these records would exist if there was no pandemic. Because you would have been out touring more. Often. You would have been out touring and I wouldn't have met Configa. And he is the producer for a good part of this new album, um, most of this new album, and then a nice slice of the Don't Fight Your Demons album too. So. I think the trajectory of the group probably wouldn't have went in the same, well, it wouldn't have went in the same direction if I wouldn't have met Configa and we wouldn't have started collaborating. So it was just a 
really great marriage creatively as well, um, me and Kafiga. And I think all of that was because of the pandemic, which sort of made this whole connection via internet happen. A lot of the album was recorded not together in the same place, obviously. Right, not at all. None of it was. Uh, I've never met Kafiga in person. And so those that know Kafiga via online, you know, it would seem that me and him know each other very well because we talk all the time and we banter a lot on social media, but we've never met in person. Now we've had tons of Zoom calls. We've had tons of phone calls, texts, and we've exchanged emails and, and files and music files like nobody's business, but I have never met him. And, and we were gonna do a tour, a Don't Fight Your Demons tour this year in uh, September and October, and it got postponed because of the COVID-19 virus having variants. And so yeah. Europe got closed down and so we didn't do it. So that was gonna be my chance to meet Configa and him to meet me, but it didn't work. Um, you, you've always given us uh, glimpses into uh, obvious, you know, the black experience, racial injustice, equality, homelessness, um, poverty. I mean, you, you, you've always sort of covered all the bases. Um, it seems like you've started with, with the first album, sadly, things haven't gotten better. You know what I mean? Like, it, it seems as if all these years later, we're still talking about the same thing. Um, you know, uh, women still aren't making the same amount of money as men doing the same job. Gay, gays can't get married in everywhere that they want to get married. Um, there's still the racial uh, uh, situations going on in the states. Yeah. Do you ever get disheartened by it and, and, and sit down and say, you know, I can't do this anymore? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I do. I do. And I think, you know, any activist that does this, I think if they're honest with themselves, they'll say the same, you know, it is disheartening. Now, obviously, you know, I've learned that just because it doesn't make a huge change on the Richter scale, it doesn't mean that there's no change, right? So I've learned that. I've learned that there is fans that will say I changed. Mm -hmm. I listened to Mr. Wendell and I had a from that point on, I had a whole nother perspective on the homeless. To this day, I give money to the homeless because of that song. Or people will say, you know, from our newer albums, you know, because I, you, you talked about so on and so forth on um, uh, the same people, for instance, which is on the Don't Fight Your Demons album. I now look at corporation pharmaceutical companies all being in the same sort of boat. All of these things do change people's opinions on things and a lot of people's life trajectories, right? But or it helps change it, I should say, but it may not change the overall Richter scale of, of, of these huge problems. So I think it makes a difference, but you know, sometimes as the saying goes, you know, everything seems the same until you look up and everything's different. So maybe that's gonna be the small ways that this music and other things, you know, have a, play a role. Uh, your music has made a difference. One of the things that could keep you going is, is being uh, recognized. Um, in 2019, you received the uh, uh, Black Music Honors Award. Um, that's got to be, you know, something that you're going to be very proud of, obviously. Yeah, very proud, you know, and, you know, awards are an interesting thing. You know, you you create music, whether you get an award or not, but when you do get an award, it means something, at least it does to me. And the thing that it means to me is that, okay, more than just your fans are recognizing what you've done, you know, even peers that may not be fans, they may not have bought the album, will now know that you exist and now maybe check out your music for the first time. And it, it brings more people to the, to the party. And I like that. Um, the Grammys did that for us, you know. We'll forever be known as one of the best new artists, you know, and we'll forever be known as, um, I believe, the first hip hop group to, to win best new artists. And, you know, I think to this day, we still are if I'm not mistaken. And so, you know, these things last for quite a while and, and it's benefited our career in, in big ways. So I'm, I'm grateful for these kind of awards. Yeah. Um, I wanna, uh, I love hearing where musicians kind of start out and, and realize that they want to be a musician. Um, you had an interesting uh, kind of marriage between what you do because from the music standpoint, your father owned a, a nightclub and from- yeah activism standpoint, your mother owned a, a, a newspaper. <laughs> so yeah. you had that blend of what you wanted to do going forward. What was that like growing up in that house, having you know both of those aspects? Yeah, you're right. It was a very unique blend and it's exactly who I am. I'm made up of both of those sides. So 
in my family, my dad especially would start conversations about what's going on in the black community and how can we solve it? So there would be issues and me and my brother, Terry, my adopted brother, Bright, who's actually from Ghana, and my mom and dad would sit at the table and talk a lot about how to solve issues that were going on in the black community. And that was a big um, catalyst for how I would start to think and how I would later want to make music. And um, my mom being an activist in the newspaper business, because she owns the, the largest black newspaper in Wisconsin. So it's not only a newspaper, but a black newspaper focused on black issues. So that actually helps to be aware of what the issues are. And then my dad being a nightclub owner, um, primarily black uh, clients that would come and dance and have fun and drink and stuff like that at his club. You know, we were playing a lot of black music, we're playing a lot of Marvin Gaye, a lot of the spinners and Ohio players and Cameo and, and Ray Parker Jr. and radio and just all of this incredible R&B music growing up really immersed me into musicality too. So there's, there was both sides, you know, um, that I was getting my input from. As a teenager <laughs> in the club. Yeah. <laughs> I started DJing at age 13 at my dad's nightclub. And I learned from his DJs who were much older. And I was obviously too young to be in a club, but because my father owned it, I was able to get in there and hang out. And, you know, it was, it was the best experience for me because I learned how to rock a party. I learned how to keep the dance floor packed. When I started DJing, it was in the late 70s. So, you know, hip hop style of DJing became a thing. And I was the one in Milwaukee that was learning it. So most DJs in Milwaukee, like 99% of them didn't even have a clue of how to scratch, <laughs> how to mix records on beat. So I was the guy that was bringing that technique to my city. And so, yeah, it was, it was a great exposure point for me. Um, I want to go back a bit to the first record. Um, in my opinion, it's one of the I think one of the best hip hop albums ever made. I, I, I always you. thought that. Uh, you came in at a time that it seemed as if um, there were two types of hip hop. There was there was the the I don't want to say angry hip hop, but you know the Public Enemy and 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 uh, the guys from N.W.A. were doing their own thing at the time. And then there was the upbeat, fun hip hop. With, you know the MC Hammer and and the and the, the uh, young MC and stuff. Um, you guys came in and kind of were a mixture of those two. You, you were dealing with the issues head on, um, meaningful lyrics, uh, but at the same time, an upbeat kind of love vibe to the music. Um, is that, do you think you just guys just struck a chord that was needed at that time? Yeah, I do think we struck a chord that was needed. And on purpose, you know, rest of development, we needed to be authentic. And the authenticity of us was we're from the South. You know, we're, we're not from New York. We're not from the urban areas. We're from the South. Well, the civil rights movement was born in the South. It had a different approach to striving to fight injustice, right? So it was sometimes in the black church with a, with a roaring, you know, Hammond B3 organ and some incredible gospel singing. Sometimes it was in the form of marching and nonviolent um, protest. You know, other times it was in great speeches and or, oratory, orator skill, you know, behind a pulpit. And so it was just different energies coming from the South than it was from Long Island, which is public enemy or, you know, or, you know, Brooklyn or, or the Bronx, you know, it's just a different energy. And so I think we are just striving to be true to who we were at the time. Um, yeah. So that's, that was just what Arrested Development was. I feel like our music was just as potent as public enemy. I understand the need for rage. I think rage is great. Public Enemy is one of my, you know, big influences. Um, but for me as an MC and as a as an artist, I wanted to transform that rage into something that I felt was more um, effective at the end of the day. So turn that rage into something, mm -hmm. and that was what I wanted the rest of Development's music to be more like. Uh, you guys got to do an MTV uh, uh, gig as well, the MTV show. I love that. Turn that, yeah. turn that into a record. Um, then the se the second album comes out. Things started to kind of implode within the group. Um, That's true. With all the upheaval in the band and the turnover, and and you did your solo thing, which I also thought was great. Um, Thank you. And that kind of exposed you to the whole other side of the world. Um, what made you bring the group back 
four or five years later and say, we can do this again. We, we can do this the right way this time. It was totally Ishi. Uh, Ishi's one of the members of the group. She's our dancer. Um, she called me and said, speech, you know, because at this time, my solo career was booming. I mean, it was, but it was booming in Japan. It was booming in Asia. So I was touring throughout Asia, selling gold records one after the other, constant radio promotional tours and constant. Um, I'd say the venues were probably like 3,000 seat venues all over Asia. So it was great. I mean, I had a great time doing that solo run. And then Ishi, on the other hand, was back here in America and she wanted to put the group back together. And I was willing to entertain it because I love the group and I started the group. So when she said, hey, can we do this again? I was like, yeah, let's, let's try it. And we all sat down at a little steakhouse here in Atlanta and sat down over a meal and talked about what we wanted to do in order to heal the sort of broken hearts and broken minds that we had already felt about each other and, and make some music again. So we did that in the year 2000. Do you, do you think after all this time and, and kind of what's what's the different main difference, I guess, between the new version of Arrested Development, not new, because again, you've been doing this for 20 years now, back together, yeah. um, and the original version. Is it just apples to oranges or is it two different feels? You know, there is two different feels. I think over the years, my, my take on Arrested Development is every record I wanted to add to our basically to the diversity of our playlist. So every record, I look at it like, well, what, what kind of style of hip hop aren't we doing in our live show? And let's do a record that has more of that so that we can incorporate it in our live show. So that's how I looked at it. So like, for instance, the last two albums are a lot more boom bap oriented, more straight up, you know, beats, backpack hip hop style, you know, a little closer to uh, the raucous records type of style. Um, with most deaf and Talib Kweli and, and Common and, you know, a little closer to that energy um, than anything we had done sort of prior. And that was intentional, you know, working with Kafiga was very intentional to try to um, guide us more into that direction. And it turned out to be very, very beloved by fans. Like they were looking forward to seeing the lyrical content of Arrested Development married to the sort of harder street edge beats that hip hop had become known for in the late nineties, early two thousands. And that was, that, that was fine with me too. Cause I love hip hop with that style and we had that in our catalog. So I felt really great about doing that. Um, when, when you mentioned it's on Bandcamp now, but uh, when can you, we expect to see the, the full album on the other streaming services or for sale? Uh, on uh, December 10th, Friday, December 10th, it comes out. So we'll release a few things. We'll release the album um, Friday, December 10th. We release our new swing uh, and we'll release the music video for Swam on Friday, December 10th. Am I frozen? <laughs> Well, I think I am. I'm not 100%. The horrible thing about that nowadays is we're doing Zoom calls and half the time it works, half the time it doesn't. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. The new uh, track from Arrested Development, um, as I said, is called Vibe. Uh, it's out now featuring uh, Big Daddy Kane. Um, this has been an absolute thrill for me um, because I am a big fan of Arrested Development, have been since you guys came to the forefront. Uh, I've always loved your style of hip hop because uh, you know, Black Sheep, and <clears throat> and here in Canada we had uh, Dream Warriors, which was yeah. Uh, I yeah. love Dream Warriors. Yeah, so yeah. We, we had that, and and uh, so I, I'm a big fan. So it's been great talking to you. Um, they I, I, they say that music sticks with you, and and uh, a good song can can become a classic song uh, if you remember those lyrics and it sticks with you years later. You mentioned it earlier, but um, to this day, for me, I can't walk past somebody with a hat out or or a guitar case on the ground and not put money in. Wow. Um, because of Mr. Wendell. I mean, that song has all- Wow, that's great, man. That's great. Uh, $2 means a snack for me, but it means a big deal to you. I mean, that has always stuck with me. So uh, I can't Thank wait you. for the record and uh, good luck with it. And hopefully, eventually, we can get you through Canada uh, touring. <laughs> yeah, I love to. We love Canada. We've done a lot of like Calgary folk festivals there. We've done a lot of different festivals in Canada and all of which we love. 
So I can't wait to get there too. Yeah. Thank I think you. the last time I saw you perform was uh, way back when opening for Hootie and the Bowfish, actually. <laughs> oh, wow. And that was my solo career. So that was just speech. Yeah. <laughs> that was forever ago. Well, thank you so much again. Best of luck with the record speech. And thank you so much for being with us. Have a great day. Thank man. you. Take you care. too.